NASCAR is back in the heart of the third largest city in America, Chicago, Illinois. And Windy City is the backdrop once again for NASCAR. And today it's the Xfinity Series practice and qualifying from all around Grant Park here in this beautiful, beautiful area of Chicago. And once again, we'll be taking over the streets, most famous Lakeshore Drive, Columbus, Michigan. Steve, it's amazing that we're back here at this just beautiful setting where NASCAR is able to, well, throw out all those speed limits that these guys in Chicago always used to have to abide by. We're going to see cars get upwards of 150 miles an hour on Lakeshore Drive. Well, for me, as a sports guy, it might be the third largest city in the U.S., but it is a sports city. You think Boston, New York, Chicago. So when NASCAR comes to town, you wonder how it will be accepted. Well, I will tell you, it's with open arms. You walk around the city, in the airport, on the news, everyone is excited to have NASCAR back. I know we were here last year, but Mother Nature apparently didn't want us here because it <laughs> rained for two straight days, but not in to this weekend, look at the weather, it's beautiful, the track is dry. These drivers, why it's the same track as last year, in dry conditions, I'm wondering if they're not learning it for the first time again. Yeah, no real notebooks. One thing that we love to do when we come to Chicago and the streets is call this one radio styles. So even though you're gonna see beautiful pictures of this course, we will have people in different areas around the course. And one of those that will be doing double duty, turning or calling turns one and six will be from MRN and Sirius XM. Mike Bagley has the call from those two corners. Good morning, Rick. Glad to be back here in the streets of Chicago. And as you can hear behind me and see behind me, NASCAR Xfinity Series teams on the track. Turn one is that left-hander that leads you down Balbo to DuSable Lakeshore Drive. And that's a quite a testy turn. All these corners are testy. They're very tight. They're very, very unforgiving. If you get into trouble, more times than not, you're going to take someone along for the ride. That's turns one and two. DuSable Lakeshore Drive starts at the exit of turn two and runs all the way down the length to where Dylan Welch is positioned all the way, basically on the far extreme end of the course. That's right, Mike, and the cars are going behind me right now, and I'm basically right on top of them here at the entry and apex of turn number four, so the cars will go down to Sabo Lakeshore Drive. It's a quick kind of right-hand bend through turn number three, and then here in turn number four is a 90-degree, really narrow right-hander. This is where Shane Van Gisbergen made the winning pass in the Cup Series race on Justin Haley last year, and being here for the first time and seeing how narrow this area is makes that move all the more impressive because there is not very much room down here. There's tire barriers on the left. That turns you onto Roosevelt Road. It's a short burst down that and then the 90 degree right hand turn five which is Columbus Drive and that leads you all the way back down to the back side of the course. We'll go to Mike Bagley first over there in six but on the other end of the property is Jeff Burton who's over in turn number 11. Yeah, over here it's really interesting because Turn seven leads to Michigan Avenue. There's people in those hotels sleeping right now, or they were sleeping, because now they're being woken up. They go up into East Congress Plaza, which is an uphill, long left-hand sweeper that comes downhill back onto Michigan, and then a 90-degree corner. A log jam here last year, a car in the Cup Series spun out. The entire racetrack got blocked. Then they go up the racetrack, a little short shoot to the start-finish line. This is the tightest part of the racetrack where I am. And Steve, interesting, uh, Jeff used the word up. There is an area where you have elevation change, where you go up over those are railroad tracks underneath there. It's a bridge that carries you up and over. So there's elevation change where you go at the peak of that hill and you're still accelerating before you get into like turn seven or turn 12. Yeah, your vision is definitely a challenge. When we talk about street courses and how narrow it is, there's space enough for the cars, it's just, you know, your eye line is we're on board now here with Ty Gibbs. This is heading into the left-hander, turn six. 90 degrees. Now we're going to climb that bridge that you talked about. You see, you can't even really see your braking zone down into seven. You kind of cross the hill. You almost break before you could see it. Right hand turn onto Michigan Ave. You see very narrow, very precise. And now all the drivers talk about this being way faster than you think as now we're on Congress Plaza. Listen in on the throttle. Just babying it. It's really not wide open. Now we're heading basically straight at Jeff Burton. We're going to turn right through turn 11, over to turn 12, and back onto the front stretch, Kim. 
And we had high hopes for Parker Clearman coming to, into this weekend, knowing how good of a road course racer he is. Early issues, though, for the 48 in that team. They likely will have to change an engine after qualifying. They came to the garage this morning. It had leaked overnight when they fired up the car. The team told me water shot out of the exhaust. So right now, they're going to try and keep him on track. They're going to try and qualify because, remember, they get their pit stall selection for Pocono next week, which is a big deal. But I got word from Crew Chief Patrick Donahue, the likelihood that they are changing an engine after qualifying is very high. Good, we got a spin already in turn one. That's the 53. Pinko Muta out of Tokyo, Japan. Japan. One. Kinko, the 44-year-old. That was the 2018 NASCAR Wheeling Euro Series Challenger Trophy winner. Gets it straightened back out and He'll head back around and towards the museum there as he's headed toward you, Dylan. So you wonder if the slow car in front of him didn't catch him off guard, right? You see the first car kind of come in the 14 off pace, and we talked about that vision, Rick, and I just think Castro being off pace in that 14 caught the 53 off guard, maybe you know, almost shocked him a little bit. Got on the rear brakes, got it spun around. Doesn't look like there's a lot of damage. Most important thing now with 45 or 43 minutes left is just track time. Just try to get as many laps as you can and find a rhythm. Number 35 of Brad Perez. Well, and this is the one that kind of scares you. That's a great position because that's driver's right, as we see now the red is out. But I think that's your biggest fear, right? So if you put him, say, driver's left over there near a corner yeah. exit, it's really a blind corner. While there are at least a couple spotters hey, per it's team. It's coming out of one. And uh, no matter what, I just kept trying to give it power, but I think there's still fuel coming in. I saw the fuel pressure drop. Like so if he's having a fuel pressure, that's mechanical, right? He absolutely has fuel on board with only a couple laps into practice. So. A mechanical issue I'll have to diagnose but what I was saying with two spotters you know they're gonna help you in certain areas but no one can see the entire racetrack unless you're lucky enough maybe to spot from this drone this would <laughs> I'd be great if you could just follow my car around and again Brad Perez stopped there on DeSable Lake Lakeshore Drive a practice underway from Chicago This summer, things get a bit more despicable as Drew, the world's favorite supervillain turned anti-villain league agent, returns for an exciting bold era of Minions Mayhem, packed with non-stop action, filled with Illumination signature humor, Despicable Me, in theaters now. Kim, a unique area here in the streets of Chicago. How do you spot from different areas around this track? Well, it's very tricky, and you guys kind of touched on it, the limited visibility that some of the spotters have, and this is going to be one of the big challenges for the race, something that they're working through during practice. When I talked to drivers, they said they have to rely a lot less on the spotters than they would at any other racetrack. So some of the ball is in the driver's court in terms of reading what's happening on the course. But then in addition to that, there are multiple spotters the drivers will be using. So these drivers typically have one spotter on a weekend. They are familiar with that voice. Well, now they have two and three voices in their ears. They're trying to get accustomed to those voices. Specifically, I talked with Joey Logano. So we know Joey uses Coleman Presley on the Cup Series weekends. And typically, if a Cup Series driver runs an Xfinity race, they will bring over their Cup Series driver. Well, he signed on to that AM Racing car very late after AM Racing had already signed on the spotters they were using for this weekend. So Joey told me today during practice, practice it's all about getting the communication style down of those spotters that he does not normally hear in his ear cars rolling once again here on the streets of Chicago again a red flag came out as the 35 of Brad Perez was stopped on DeSable Lakeshore Drive a bagman here comes Allgaier here he comes Justin Allgaier setting sail down 
Lakeshore Drive getting set for a run into the backside of the corner with Dylan Wells. And they go by me right now. He saw Cole Custer, last year's winner of this race behind Allgaier, works his way through the right-hand turn number five, and he's on to Columbus Drive, headed back to six. And he is headed into the 90-degree left-hander in turn six. That'll turn him back onto Balbo. Then he'll have a thousand foot straight away before he gets to turn seven and that 90 degree. That's turn six. He's on the short straight away, getting ready to come over the bridge. And this will be a right hander on the turn seven that will bring Little Gator back onto Michigan Avenue and headed to Jeffer. Yeah, a lot of drivers last year wrecked right here at the left side impact, hit that wall, clean there for Algar. Through this loop, everybody's hugging that left side, then back down the hill. Little short shoot, heavy braking, 90 degree corner. Use all the racetrack. You have to use all the racetrack. There's a ton of speed. You'll see the fastest guys all but hitting the wall every straightaway. Right into turn 12, and they've just gone through what will be the restart zone. And then right there is going to be very difficult to make pit road, but you've got to commit early. You've got to hug that turn 12 corner on the inside before you go down this long shot of Columbus and right into turn one. And the locals are jealous. He just tripped into triple digits there coming at the end of the straightaway. Speed limit in this park about 35, 45 miles an hour. Obviously maximizing those speeds. Justin Allgaier and others are as he heads back up to Sabo Lakeshore Drive. And they work down towards turn number three and four. The Field Museum of Natural History here behind us. A second group of spotters down here as Allgaier gets sideways and into the wall in turn number four. We talked about how narrow that was. There's tire barriers right there that caught him, but he broadsided it here at the exit of turn four as the rest of the field stands by. Here, but... And that was a big hit. He slid into turn four and driver sided into those tires. A big hit. All the drivers talk about not only how fast Caught that corner is and how narrow it is, but how rough it is. Oh, as we see another contact right there, the late oh, yellow. Yeah, oh, yeah the 45 hit. of Alan Day came in there yeah, at finally. speed. Look at it, tore the whole driver's side off yeah. of that car. I heard the yellow is out. You hear all guys frustration and you understand why he's sitting there with, you know, nowhere to be. You obviously the 45 didn't get the information. He's going to show his displeasure. And so really, two Can you drive this thing back to the truck or what? If it'll drive, yes. Drive it to the truck. If it'll drive, that'll save us a lot of time. So that's communication. What they mean is, unlike a normal racetrack, where do you bring the car? Well, pit road in the in the garage area is very separate. So, Dylan, what do you you make from your point of view. Well, it's amazing, guys. There, there are spotters right here behind turn four. Kim talked about where they're all laid out and spread out across the racetrack. You see them right there. They are all down here with a perfect view of Allgaier into the wall. I don't really understand how that happened because Allgaier sat here for quite a long time, and the spotters are right here with a perfect view of it. Yeah, he was talking, and we we're looking at the transmission from him. He's like, hey, man, I didn't know there was a yellow. He said he was never told. And that we, you know, we just talked about spotters being in different places and different combinations of spotters and drivers. And the other thing to add is local yellows, the possibility that it's not yellow the entire racetrack and just that information not getting to him. Because he sat there, this is the initial wreck, Dylan, but he sits here forever. Yeah, and, and so you see Allgaier, that was pretty minimal damage, and it, it looked like he was getting ready to fire it up. We saw the, the exhaust flames come out there, which indicates that the car was firing up. And you see how long he sits here, all those cars that go by, and here comes the 45. Steve mentioned it. It is a fast corner down here. So if you're, if you're off the marks a little bit or if you can't use all the racetrack and you're coming through there at full speed, you're not going to make it. So when there's a car kind of sticking its, uh, you know, its backside out like that, as you see another look here, all guy are pretty significant contact with that tires. If you're coming through here at a high rate of speed or at close to full speed and, and you don't have all the racetrack to use, you're not going to make it. And that's kind of what happened here. And Dylan, great work by that tire barrier. You see the second impact, which luckily, you know, it's severe, but it's more body work than actual chassis to chassis. But can you imagine? Tire Barry did a nice job, Rick. That would have been a hard hit, driver's side, into a concrete barrier. Again, the 45 of Alande comes in and tears the whole driver's side portion of his car off and more damage to the 7 of Allgaier. Both cars going back to the garage. Second red flag condition in the streets of Chicago, and it happens right here on Roosevelt 
Court. And that second contact was big. So you have to remember that wall that looks very short from here. If you sit in this race car, you're eye level with that wall. So you can't really see to the right. So we get the seven in. Now he sits there for a long time, but back to the spotter communication, NASCAR's communication. You see the cars come through. Some have slowed down. Some have come by at some pretty good pace. You see right there, Ty Gibbs coming by. And then the other thing I will give the 45 is he's right behind the car that enters. So I don't think he can see on corner entry, you know, what exactly he has as you see all these cars come through right there. So let's go on board with Ty Gibbs. We mentioned driver view. Look at this, you can't see to the right. Just right there. Now he's slowing off the pace, so it's clear to me that Ty knew that there was an issue in that corner that's much slower than what we'd expect him to enter at. And as you mentioned, he didn't have a car directly in front of him. That's the other thing that he couldn't have seen that seven sitting there in turn four. But this is why you're going to have to watch later today because right. it's practice a single file. Wait till we drop the green two wide, 18 rows deep. I mean, it's going to be a mess. Dylan, I'm not sure I want to be as close as you are. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that <laughs> you can have the, the lift that close to the action. Well, yeah, I'll tell you, the uh, I've got to make sure I get turned around here because my back kind of faces the car sometimes when uh, when these guys come through here. But they just towed uh, Alain Day's car off the racetrack, and as we saw, the whole left side was gone. There is a lot of debris down here. So we've talked about just kind of the nature of these street circuits with uh, the, the material or the, the oil and things that kind of get into the racing surface. Now, too, you're going to have potentially shrapnel and all kinds of things that the crew is just that the safety crew is just trying to get cleaned up over here uh, before you go and make the right hand turn and turn five onto Columbus Drive. So they've got all the sweepers down here, uh, the AMR safety team with brushes and everybody to make sure that uh, the, the, the materials gets cleaned up and sweeped up over here on Roosevelt. But there is a lot to clean up down here between both the seven and the 45 car in their collision. So we have seen where Dylan Welsh is perched there on the inside of the apex of turn four. Let's take a look at the whole track here. The street course built, actually they just closed down the streets last night. So there was traffic on here until Friday. And we have Mike Bagley right there at the center of the apex of turns one and six on Columbus Drive. Dylan Welsh will be in turn four. And Jeff Burton down on Michigan Avenue as they make that right-hand turn in 11, go up over the bridge and into turn 12 and onto the front stretch where Steve and I will be watching as they come across the start-finish line. But that is the use of Lakeshore Drive, Columbus, and Michigan Avenue. Of course, they take that East Colum or Congress Plaza Drive loop, which is really an impressive little uh, array of turns that they've got to negotiate through and you know the other thing is you see the jet dryers you know the other signature to a street course remember while nascar only does it here street racing exists in a lot of other forms of motorsport we always see the track continue to gain grip as the racing tires put rubber into what the groove is remember this has oil and sand and salt from everyday traffic so while nascar does the best they can blowing it off and cleaning it off it's never going to be as clean as a racetrack until the race cars get out there and i think that might be what caught the seven I talked about the bumps into turn four, but also just the level of grip. Uh, you know, we're seeing lap times kind of vary all over. I know they're getting used to the racetrack, but also figuring out, you know, which pavement. You see the dark pavement, then the light pavement. You know, there's so many different surfaces. There's all guy right there going in to get checked out after a couple hits. We'll call it the infield care center that he will go get checked out in. A full day and weekend uh, from Chicago. Coming up next here on USA will be Victory, Victory Lane Review. That's of Nashville from a week ago. Then cup practice and qualifying at 12.30. Pro motocross from Redbud at 2 o'clock. That's on NBC and streaming on Peacock. And then, of course, we will be on NBC and streaming on Peacock for the Xfinity Series race from this afternoon. That gets underway at 3 p.m. Eastern time and 3.30. One of the breathtaking things about coming to Chicago is the backdrop and that Chicago River there running right through Chicago and so many beautiful buildings and landmarks that are available to everyone that comes and visits the Windy City. A week ago, we were in Music City, USA in Nashville, but I think Chicago really is famous for all of the different concerts that can take place here see some of the acts that will be here this weekend so a part of this event 
are the different superstars that are putting on concerts. You see the stage in the background there. That's right in Grant Park. And here's the schedule for the concerts that are taking place. Again, today at 5 o'clock, the Black Keys. 8 o'clock, the Chainsmokers. Tomorrow morning at 11.30, Lauren Elena. And then at 1 o'clock, Keith Urban takes the main stage. But this area here, and Steve, I know your son Tyler came out here for Lollapalooza. He said it's the same stage. They use the same setup. It is an impressive stage. The whole, that whole Grant Park area, that center ball field area, it's going to be a great time. And that's really, when I look at last year in the weather, that was the big thing that had to get canceled is the, the concerts. And I think that's what's going to make this more than just a race. Such a festival event. And uh, you see cars are back on the track. The reason for the red earlier, we had the seven. Uh, with an issue in turn four and then Alon Day and the 45 got into him and Kim is standing by with a lot Yeah, Alon out of the care center after that heavy hit with Justin Allgaier Questions though on the communication you were able to hear in your car because Justin was sitting so long in that position Yeah, I mean when I came there, I mean on my side. I couldn't hear anything. Uh, I came really really hot uh, What can I say? It's really I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed for myself or out the prime team with Jay's society sponsor. Um, yeah, that was a quick, very quick weekend. Um, what can I say? I, w I wish I could know that Justin is there. Um, I also followed the 39 car. We went really quick into the corner and then suddenly everybody breaking and the car show up in the middle. So it was just disappointing. I guess there's no backup car to get ready for qualifying? I don't think so. That's a long day. Unfortunately, had to qualify into the race to be racing this afternoon. He won't get to see that. Yeah. Oh, man. unfortunate as we, yeah, once again, the 53 into the tire barriers here. Muta again. Yeah, a little more damage this time. You see uh, that big gap kind of on the deck lid right in this whole area right here, right? There's some pretty heavy damage. This is turn two. Oh, you see Ty Gibbs on the inside, and that gets the 53 in that outside lane. And then Ty didn't do anything wrong. That is a passing zone. We've seen corners there. I just think the 53 gets a little high. Probably the track not as good. You see the right front lock up and contact. And that's, so you see to the left there, that's the 19 of Gibbs in the corner that's cleaning up. Once again, nothing wrong. The 53 just gets wide. It's dusty. It's dirty. Misjudges the speed being in the non-preferred groove. And that's Kenko Buda of Japan that got into the tire barriers there. We talk as we're back under red. You know, well, now we're back under green because he drove away, which I love this because practice was definitely disappearing quickly for these teams. Connor Mozak goes to the top of the board at a 132.2. That's nearly a second and a half faster than what was the fastest time. That's just the teams getting more comfortable and the track getting cleaner. This will continue all day. And Allgaier also out of the infield care center and is standing by with Kim. And it all started with a slide in turn four, first of all. So what were the track conditions when you first had an incident? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, getting into four there, you, there's a few really steep bumps that we kind of just left the ground and unfortunately started sliding into this. Such a treacherous spot there. And <laughs> unfortunately, I pride myself in not having to go to a backup car very often and, and really hate it for everybody. It, Brent Fresh and I culture, everybody on this seven team. I mean, the guys did an amazing job. I'm sitting there, and I, and I honestly thought we were going to be just fine, and you see the aftermath. I, I think we could have maybe fixed the car from the first damage, and um, not anymore. So really, really disappointing. Obviously, home state, home race for me. A lot of um, a lot of want to come up here and do well. We had a great car last year, and unfortunately, our Camaro is not in great shape. So we'll get a backup car out and hopefully uh, have a great rest of the afternoon, but rely on our teammates now. We know Alon had no communication as to what happened, that you were sitting there. For you, did anybody tell you on his approach, or was it a complete shock when he hit you? Uh, my guys were giving me an update on how many cars were still coming, you know, so I knew that there were still cars coming. That's why I didn't reverse out of the tire barrier. Just at that moment, it's kind of a really bad, a vulnerable spot. So I didn't want to reverse. Unfortunately, you know, there's people in that corner. That's actually, like, right in front of the spotter stand. So I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, I know that in his weekend, you know, the last thing he wants to do is hit me, right? I mean, that's not 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 what he wants to do. It's just lack of communication, unfortunately. And probably took a race car that was maybe fixable and took it out of the race. Um, but I know that it definitely took theirs out of the race. So at least we have a backup car. We'll be able to, to work on our stuff and get better. But just hate that we put our guys behind that that far starting the weekend. It's it's not not ideal.
Justin Allgaier and this team. A lot of work to do before they race here this afternoon to get that back up ready. As Justin Allgaier prepares to get that backup car ready, let's take a ride with A.J. Allmendinger. He's just cleared turn number five, and he is headed down Columbus into turn six. He's going to hang the left-hander on the Balbo, and this is where he's up to 140. We got a spinner. Sorry, don't interrupt you. We got a spinner. 53 car around again. He's going to get it fired up. Actually, yeah, he's fired up. Trying to get it turned around. You can see... Yeah, how narrow the racetrack is. There is a little runoff here where you could go straight. Come start the day. Row so we can work on it. Track still green. You see, you're trying to use all the racetrack, back of the car sliding around, and again on corner entry. This is not the rear grip he keeps expecting. Look how tight it is. See the runoff? This is one corner that there's several, but not a lot of race track here where you can leave if you have a problem. This is one of them. You can just go straight, get the car slowed down, but there's a lot of trouble so far for him getting that car. Jeff, here comes Shane Van Ginsbergen. He's coming into the same area off of turn seven and heading up into Congress Plaza. Yeah, this guy right here, I want you to pay attention to how he drives this race car. He attacks the corners, uses every bit of the racetrack. This is what this is what he's comfortable doing. And this is what the NASCAR guys are gonna have to get comfortable doing, being right against those walls. If you're not used to this, it's very intimidating, kind of claustrophobic, you know, feeling where you just not used to having walls this close to you. He's accustomed to it and takes advantage of it. And if you didn't know anything about supercars, then you probably wouldn't have known Shane Van Gisbergen's name until one year ago when he came to Chicago and stunned everyone. Well, this is SVG heading into that turn four. The same place the seven had his issue. You see him downshift, and you can almost see he's super uncomfortable, bails out. He was basically on the same track to what happened to the seven. SVG goes left, uses that extra runoff. Busy spot down to turn four and five. See right there, you can tell he can't turn the wheel, and he just has to correct. And Steve, that, that's, that's a part of the racetrack that you can learn what your car can do. And I think that's what this practice is about for a guy like SVG. He's not just trying to make his way around the racetrack, he's trying to win this race. And you can find the limits of the race car and use those runoffs. If you overshoot it, use those runoffs. Now you learn, now you know how, how hard you can attack. He has just cleared turn six, and he's about to turn right into seven on the Michigan Avenue. He is so smooth at this part of the racetrack. But then again, Jeff, he is smooth all over this racetrack. Yeah, he really is. But Ty Gibbs, fastest so far. He's going to be a threat today. All of the NASCAR drivers, you know, this guy's won the last two road course races in the Xfinity Series, and they don't like that. Like, they want to take this away from him. They want to step their game up and take the fight to him. It was life-changing one year ago. He had no aspirations of being a part of NASCAR on a full-time basis, but after the huge Cup Series win here on the streets of Chicago, his life changed, and now full-time in the Xfinity Series. I think all of our lives changed. We didn't know who he was last year. Almost no one could even say his name, but he said that name, and he made his mark last year loud and clear. And I think Jeff's right. I think everybody is on a is on a mission to take the wind out of Superman's cape, as it were. And right now, we're going to have some work to do. He's going to have some work to do on this race course headed to Dillon in turn four. Yeah, and he works through four right now. And the amount of cars that have been out of shape over here at this end of the racetrack and have not crashed has been remarkable. There's a transition in pavement uh, material. It goes from kind of an asphalt patch to concrete, and it has had everybody out of shape over here in four. SVGs at the end of Columbus Drive and making the left-hand turn through six now. Yeah, and he's headed to turn seven. He really hooks the inside wall in six. And as you see, when he comes up over the bridge into seven, he'll sling that car wide right up against that wall to get that, to get that launch down Michigan. To the top of the chart goes Shane Van Gisbergen. We expected that. And 
one more time. More issues through four and five. Sheldon Creed got into the wall here. Yeah, it's pretty serious contact. I mean, that's doesn't look bad because he hits it so square and flat, but that can do damage to the car. Another little contact right here, the 44 pool. A few cars making their way back onto pit road to the attention of their crews and of course one of those being the 18 where you see Sheldon Creed stopped and they take a look at that driver's side yeah looking at the wheels I thought it was a little harder impact than that it's actually you see some some body scratches but the wheels don't look bad at all Kim yeah, and if you're listening to the driver, he's not really overly concerned about it. Right when he hit the wall, he said, guys, I got into the left side. I don't think it's that bad. Then once he's now sitting on pit road telling them he feels like he just pancaked it and hit it flat. We'll see if any issues come of that. Before that, though, he was saying very, very loose and just a lot of bouncing he's getting in his car. He said he needs more grip to keep up with the 19 of Ty Gibbs. Following more cars around the racetrack, here's John Hunter Nemechek. He works through the right-hand turn number four, and here's the right-hand turn number five off Roosevelt and on to Columbus Drive. Second place finisher last year, looking for more this year, Baggy. And right now he is seventh on the leaderboard, trying to get some more speed in that in that Toyota under braking. He'll cut hard drivers left through six, just skirt that inside wall, take that wide exit, and then convert over to now make the right-hander onto Michigan Avenue in turn seven. Yeah, John Hunter Nemechek, he's gonna have his hands full this weekend. When they got to the racetrack, they found out they had an engine problem. They had to change engine in this race car, so he will have to start in the back of the field today, no matter where he qualifies. So track position being a premium here, he's gonna get a lot of track opportunity, which could help him for the cup race tomorrow. Yeah, being able to do double duty on a course where you have really no notebook because a year ago it was completely different than it is this weekend with the weather the way it is but what a talented driver john hunter nemechek is he learns a lot every lap he comes off the end of the front straight away he'll cut the left into turn number one and he's doing a good job of maximizing the racetrack but not putting the car in a bind he's still on the quest for more speed but Dylan, he is solid through one and two and appears to be solid up to Sable Lakeshore Drive. And we'll see this transition in pavement as he goes through turn three right here and fades back to the left to set up for the right-hand turn four. Right there is where all of these cars have been getting upset going through the corner. They work through four and now Nemechek again out of turn number five. Here we are on Connor Mozak. Connor, second fastest. Do not be surprised to see this car running up front. A lot of people are talking about this young man, 25 years old, driven late models as 26 Xfinity starts. A best of fifth at Watkins Glen, Trans Am winner. He is a good road racer trying to make a name in this series. We see a lot of junior motorsports finding some incredible talents as these are pretty talented drivers behind the wheel here, navigating the streets of Chicago. The 29-year-old Sage Karam climbs out of that number 26. And so it looks like another backup car. Now three cars have been damaged enough that they'll have to go to backups. Pretty good hit there, Steve. Yeah, big hit. That's turn six right in front of Bagley. It's a left-hander. You see the back of the car come around. You know, and it's kind of the catch-22. The tires are there to absorb the impacts, but it also narrows the track. So that's a situation where I still think you would have hit the outside wall, but there, you know, you have to have them there or there would be some real bad angles to be able to hit the concrete barriers. You can almost see that it moved that barrier a little bit there. Let's take another look right underneath the cameraman. What a great shot. You hear the impact. I was getting ready to say there, there was no camera operator on the camera that we were just uh, sitting yeah. there. You were looking at the one that was the up crane. on the lift. Yeah, I was thinking okay. how you would do on top of the crane, right? The <laughs> yeah. man's scared of heights. The robos and, and this is so much fun to see the street course, but it, it's new for everyone, yeah. right? You see the challenge for the drivers, even for us to try to figure out the streets and the corners. These practices are, there's a lot going on. It's exciting. Well, Steve, we're lucky. Uh, we have almost 100 cameras that we get to show this street course from, uh, riding along with quite a few drivers. 
But you look back, and, and right now we're over Lake Michigan looking back on the skyline. We have 100, but this is my favorite right here. I think, <laughs> I mean, the helicopter just really puts it in perspective. I never really got to spend a lot of time in Chicago until last year when we came up, and it just took my breath away. I mean, we are literally right in the middle of it all, and it's exciting to watch people that, you know, 2.7 million people. So there's a lot of people here that aren't here for the race, and they'll walk down Michigan on the sidewalk, and their curiosity is so much fun to watch what's going on. Yeah. One of the fun things yesterday, we were a part of a charity event uh, where Richard Dent, the you know, famous Chicago Bears defensive end, he was there, and he was so excited. He said, is there any way I could get behind the wheel of one of those race cars? He said, any way. He goes, God, I love to go fast, and I love driving the streets of Chicago fast. He goes, man, I'd love to get behind the wheel of one of those. And and that's what the fans here are seeing is something they've never experienced before. Bagley? Right now, as we continue to clean up the Sage Karen break or uh, crash here in turn six, the fans are beginning to congregate. They're claiming their piece of real estate for what's to come later today here on the streets of Chicago. Right off of turn four is the Field Museum of natural history and in there is Maximo the Titanosaur that's the largest dinosaur known to man and Sue which is the largest and most complete T-Rex specimen in the country and I wonder if those come to life well they do in some movies nice. <laughs> well we'll just have to see if Dylan can look over there and check them out he's right there in turn four this was turn six moments ago and again that was the 26 of Sage Karam getting into the tire barriers, having to climb out of that car. That was right next to Bagman. Bagman, what'd you think of that? Oh, it was off to your left. Look at that, boys. Poised in <laughs> position and ready to pounce. Look at that. Ready for action out here in six. He scared me there for a moment. Like, what in the world just happened over here? Sorry to say that uh, Sage Karam definitely is going to have to go to a backup car. I don't know. Bagley, Eddie was way ahead of you. He had his camera dialed in in that shot. He was wanting to know what you were waiting on to catch, pick up that action. Well, I was probably right, sitting Eddie, here coach him up, Eddie. absorbing all of that knowledge you were giving to us, and it took me a while to catch up. Look at my man go right there. I'm telling you. <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> Eddie. Appreciate you, man. <laughs> uh, we definitely are having fun here. Our crew working tirelessly. Uh, really applaud. Chicago and everyone here as well to set this up. It would take the whole show to thank everyone, but yeah. you know, they have a little bit of time to work on the park section. But you remember Michigan and Lakeshore, they don't get shut down until basically middle of the day Friday because yeah. of traffic. All night long, different air, NASCAR, uh, track personnel, te television personnel, team, you know, everyone had so much to do. Those are some new suites at the bottom of your screen right there. We, we kind of went around the track and we said, man, Lake Michigan out back, the racetrack out yeah. front. I could hang out in those suites right there. Great new view. Yeah. Riding along here with Daniel Suarez. Oh, I mean, look hang how on. quick that happened. He wasn't even really to speed, just reached down, downshifted, got a little wheel hop. He was just tightening his Tighten belt. His belts. So when I say wheel hop, basically, if you don't match the speed, the braking, and the downshift, the rear tires almost do too much of the deceleration, and they start skipping. That was that really loud kind of odd feel, and that's, I mean, around it goes quickly. I mean, I say light contact, but on the right rear of the car, yeah. the fuel fillers on that side of the car because pit stops are backwards here. Steve, we're seeing a lot of incidents in this practice session. Would you say it's because maybe people are a little more familiar and want to find that edge more than they did a year ago? Listen, I think it's the field. I think when you look at the names in the field, you cannot just tiptoe around. SVG heading down Lakeshore to you, Dylan. I think he's putting the pressure on everyone to figure it out. He is showing everybody the fast way around once again. Smoothly through the right-hander, turn four right now. Here's turn five. This is the 90-degree turn onto the long stretch down Columbus Drive and headed to turn six. This is where he made a lot of hay last year with late-breaking maneuvers coming into the corner. That's his M.O., and that's what he's doing right now. You see him downshift. He'll cut the corner. That's turn six. Doesn't swing out as wide as some of the others, but now will fade back to the left to set up for the right-hander into turn number seven. Easy now. Easy on to Michigan Avenue, and then hard on the hammer. Up, up to the gearbox, headed to Jeff Burton. Yeah, I love this view. You can see how tight the racetrack is. Everybody's chasing SVG, but this guy is not. Sam Mayer is actually fastest on racetrack right there. 
Sam Mayer and Shane Van Gisbergen have been bouncing back and forth. Who's going to lead this practice? Well, it's Sam's turn right now. Here he comes down Columbus, and he is coming in hot, late breaking into one. But he'll cut that corner perfectly, swing out wide, and he's quickly back on the gas to get over the bridge, down the hill, and back to turn seven in Michigan Avenue. Yeah, you see right here he, how aggressive he's being. We keep talking about using the racetrack. You're going to have to do that. See the caution waving behind him. Red flags out. Session's over. Sam Mayer has to have a lot of confidence going into this qualifying session. Whoa. Castro about wrecked there. Yeah, Andre Castro maybe a little surprised by Sam Mayer behind him. Well, and Sam was trying to finish his lap. I know you think the start finish line is here and it will be for the race, but for practice of qualifying, there's an alternate start finish line, which is really right in front of Jeff Burton, exit of turn 11. And Sam was trying to finish that lap to get the lap time. It was actually a great lap, like the third fastest lap in all of practice right there. So I think Castro was doing what he expected, which is practice is over. Sam Mayer, the NASCAR veteran, runs a lot. There's the white line basically right here. That's the alternate start finish line that they'll run to. And that's to just save laps. I mean, we've seen how hard it is to get clear laps. So practice is complete. Qualifying will be coming up next. Maybe somebody will grab a bite to eat. Chicago is so famous for the pizza, for the hot dogs, and everything about the cuisine here in the Windy City. We've been partaking a bit when we've been here in Chicago. You can represent your favorite driver and take advantage of the amazing deals at the NASCAR shop. Check out the greatest selection. There's T-shirts, die casts, and much more. Visit NASCAR.com slash shop. Practice is complete, and the top ten from the almost hour uh, that that practice session took, you have Sam Mayer, Shane Van Gisbergen, Ty Gibbs, A.J. Allmendinger, the normal people we would expect to be up here. Cole Custer, uh, winner from a year ago here on this track. Young Connor Mozak, uh, also inside the top ten. Kyle Larson doing double duty. Parker Kligerman, Sheldon Creed, and all the way down to Preston Pardis, the top ten. Kim? Sam Mayer at the top of the board after practice. Should be no surprise because he's got a couple of road course wins under his belt. But we were talking, you said, because of all the reds we saw, the track really not gripped up yet. What does that mean for qualifying? How cautious will people have to be? Yeah, not getting consecutive laps out there on the racetrack because of everything kind of slows down the pace a little bit for qualifying and for practice. So the track's still quite sketchy. Um, it's pretty rough out there, too. So I know our PCI Chevrolet is going to be really fast, hopefully as fast as Xfinity Internet. But... Um, this qualifying test is going to be really interesting. I'm sure that SVG, Ty, Albendinger, all those guys probably weren't going 100% either. So um, the pace is going to pick up for sure. What percent were you going? That was about 90 right there. Just optimizing what I can without slipping a tire pretty much. All right. Sounds like Sam Mayer has a little more in the tank in terms of effort here in qualifying. And right as practice was concluding the 18 of Sheldon Creed, Steve, another engine issue for JGR. Yeah, shocking. John Hunter will start at the back because of an engine issue. Now his teammate Creed as well. The rock and roll music group Chicago saying about Saturday in the park, and that's what it's going to be. Today's schedule, Victory Lane Review from a week ago, Nashville. That's coming up next on USA. Then cup practice and qualifying. Then on to Pro Motocross from Red Bud. That's on NBC and streaming on Peacock at 2 o'clock. Then we get back underway with Xfinity Series Racing here on NBC. And that race takes place right here in the streets of Chicago. And we're calling it radio style. So we will have the bag man in turns one and six calling those two turns. He'll hand off to Dylan Welsh as the cars rocket down Lakeshore Drive. And... Jeff Burton off the exit of Michigan Avenue. And they will head up Jackson until they get back to Columbus, where Steve and I will be calling that action off of Pitt Road. And let's check back in with the guys, and we'll start with Mike. 
I don't know what to expect in this race. I was looking for more in practice. We got an idea of who has speed and who's fast, but we saw trouble in turn six. Dylan had trouble in front of him. We spent more time pulling cars and wrecked race cars off the racetrack than we did actually getting speeds under our belt. It's going to be interesting. A lot of unknowns. Dylan, what about you out in turn four? Yeah, Mike, you mentioned it. The biggest crash of the day was Justin Allgaier and Alon Day right here behind me in turn number four. This is a really interesting part of the track. It is so narrow over here, but it is a fast corner. You're carrying a lot of speed. It's a pretty high commitment corner. Leads you into turn five, which sets you up for a big run down Columbus Drive to turn six, which is a big passing opportunity. This is a really crucial part of the racetrack to get right, and we've seen a lot of guys not get it right already today. We expect the intensity to continue to ramp up with qualifying in the course uh, during the race, so it's going to be a lot of fun over here in three, four, and five, Jeff. Yeah, it's such a tight racetrack, and you've heard all the drivers talk about how slick it is, and the sun's come out now, and that's only going to make it slicker. So trying to get rubber driven into this racetrack and, the, and all the stuff for the normal street washed off, we're going to come back qualify in just a few minutes. Who is willing to risk it all to sit on the pole? Cars will be rolling out onto the street course here for qualifying, and it's two groups. Each group will have 15 minutes to put their best qualifying mark up, and then the top five from each will advance to the final 10-minute round, and there'll be 10 cars on the track for that. And the whole concept, if you just tuned in for the 50 minutes of practice that we saw so many reds, split these into two groups to try to, I won't say guarantee, but hopefully guarantee, a little bit more track space, more track time, and a better chance of a clean lap as we see the 48 of Parker Kligerman. DJ, welcome in. Yeah, you, you you got here on Monday, DJ, and uh, as a Hall of Famer driving the streets here, you had to abide by the speed limit, right? Absolutely, yes, 100%. <laughs> did the whole time, and uh, I saw I was out by the lake having coffee and a bagel. I guess practice went okay there? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, maybe not. Sure, yeah. I, not, not for a few. So you've seen so many different things. Take us behind the wheel. What do you think is the biggest challenge if you had to go just do this street course having never done it before? You know, and talking to drivers before came up here this weekend and going back and looking over things they said last year and then out walking the, the track earlier in the week, how narrow some parts of it are. Uh, and then you, know, you can get an idea of how rough the entrance to some of these corners are. Uh, and those are the two things that the drivers talked about that create the, the big issues for them. Parker doing a really nice job. That was four and five, which I think is one of the narrowest, kind of like threading a needle, right? Going over the bounce, the bumps and threading that needle there. This turn six looks simple enough, but it doesn't seem to drive that way. They seem to really struggle. This weekend, all eyes are on Shane Van Gisbergen after he shocked the world and won in the Cup Series race in the inaugural street course here for Chicago. And he's standing by with Kim. Yeah, but this time we get to see him play double duty Xfinity Series and Cup. Xfinity Series practice over. Any big surprises for you out there during that session? <laughs> just how wild everyone was. You know, it's pretty hard to get in a rhythm. People were just crashing, but it's what it is. Yeah, WeatherTech Chevy is really good. I was just trying to build up and um, hard to get in a rhythm with all the red flags, but I think we're okay. We've got a few changes for qualifying. Try and make it a little better over the bumps. It's really bad, but um, I think everyone's sort of got the same problems. So, see how we go. That's SVG. Guys, I had to literally pull him away from the dating. He is doing every bit of studying he can, even though he is so good on this course. Well, and you wondered what kind of speed we were going to see. You know, Larson just ran a 129.8. Um, that's almost a second fast, well, a half second faster than what we saw in practice, right? Kligerman at yeah. 130.17. Here's the 88. Connor Bozak out on court. Oh, he got the wall. Tagged the wall there. Trying to use all the track, and he did. Trying. With, the, with the speed. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're just powering up there, and you're wanting the car to go. But the bumps will also carry you across there, and trying to get all of that figured out uh, in trying. And obviously, everybody's going to go faster here than what they did in practice. You call it, DJ, just some bouncing with the back of the car. Oh, that's just a little bit of decal work, both for the wall and the car. <laughs> Very minor for what we've seen. And we'll see. Yeah, if my driver brought it back with that little of a scratch, I'd be thanking him. <laughs> yeah, I found it interesting yesterday talking to Harrison Burton a little bit out at a charity golf event that we were at. And he was telling me one of the fastest parts of the track down at the end of Lakeshore Drive where they, they had to go through a little bit of a kink, but very, very high speeds. 
but it's very, very rough getting in there. So he was talking about braking initially, letting off a little bit, doing your downshifting to let the car roll and set, and everything that you have to go through instead of just charging the corners, braking, downshifting, and going on. We made a lot about SVG because he won here. He's won the last two Xfinity races on the road courses, but it was this guy that he's kind of beat and banged with to win those races, the 21 of Austin Hill. You know, I think of him as a speedway racer, but he always seems to be around at the end of the road courses as well. He does, and this has become quite the battle between the two, that they find themselves in this position uh, on a regular basis. And, um, yeah, I, I, won't, I don't think they're the best of friends when they're inside the race car, and uh, it makes it highly entertaining for us to watch because they're two great competitors. He's going to go again. As this is his speed lap. I think we got to see his up to speed, yeah. So this is now down into turn one, left-hander. If you look at speeds overall, that's about a 50-mile-an-hour minimum speed corner. Now you're going to jump across 900 feet to turn two, another 50-mile-an-hour right-hander. Then the longest straightaway, but not necessarily the fastest, almost 2,200 feet with that little kink and what you were talking about, what Harrison was saying right here, you kind of almost have to point it and coast in over a couple of those bumps. And we're comparing now to fifth, which is Parker Retzloff, because the top five will have a second round, so they want to get into the top five. About 105 miles an hour over the speed limit right here on Columbus, <laughs> or 140 miles an hour, however you want to look at it. The other thing that you hear the drivers talk about is the precision it takes because of how narrow and the lack of runoff areas. The other road courses that they participate on, there's usually in, in high speed corners thing, you have some areas if you happen to make a, a slight mistake, not here. And I think what I like from Sam Mayer's interview earlier, and I think what we're seeing out of this 21 right here is, while we are all trained to just go as hard as we can, although we had a great little section, section through Congress Plaza as he gained a bunch of speed, and that's going to jump him up to the top five. I like, I can, dare I say, a cautious approach. If you wreck, we're going to have so much work trying to get another car together. But you see the 21 running a second lap. You could do that, get into that rhythm. This is Jesse Love out on track, teammate to Austin Hill. Kind of ease into it. It's almost like Darlington practice, DJ. Like, <laughs> yeah. we're not going to get any better if the first thing we have to do is fix the right side. Yes. But you still go out there. Yeah. You've got this mindset that, okay, I'm going to somewhat take it easy. But your, your competitive side takes over. <laughs> you feel a little bit of grip here. You're like, oh, well, now we're getting more rubber down. The track's feeling a little bit better. And you try to get a little more. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in trouble. Kim. Well, last year it was Cole Custer that came home victorious in the Chicago street course, but that practice session was very stunted. The pace of it seemed like guys couldn't get a good read on the track or their cars. How does that influence your approach to this qualifying session? Uh, it was definitely interesting, but I felt like we got enough laps where we could get a feel for it, what we had. I felt like our Andy's frozen Custer Ford Mustang was pretty solid. Uh, we were obviously in the top five, so um, just got to keep trying to get that a little bit more. But it's dollar cones if we finish top five with the Andy's car, so we did in Texas hopefully do it again. But uh, I'm really pumped for this weekend. It's, it's really cool being downtown Chicago. All right, you guys heard it. Cones, if he finishes top five, if that's not an incentive, I don't know what is. I didn't have a favorite, but it's hard. <laughs> I could be swayed. We may now. I know Brad Doherty's all for it. Oh, yeah. He wants an ice cream cone. He's in line right now. Yeah. yeah. How about this young man in the two, Jesse Love? I mean, kind of new to this ride, and, and I won't say he's new to racing because we've seen him in, in ARCA and some other series, but such a young driver behind the wheel and impresses me every week. 19 speed. years old. Yeah, speed everywhere is the most impressive thing. And when you see that, and he's not, he's getting this speed and not really tearing up equipment, and he's finishing a lot of laps in the majority of the races. Yeah, jumped up in the top five. At the bottom of the screen, you're going to see that seven of Allgaier, and even below him, we have Sage Karen, both involved in accidents. So I don't expect those guys to make a lap. And then Day, unfortunately, in the 45, had to qualify on time. He was in that accident with the seven, so he's not going to be able to take part in the race later today. Beautiful time of year here in Chicago is you see the trees right along Lake Michigan. Jesse Love rocketing into turn number four. You know, normally 
I always feel like when we go up high at the ovals, we feel like it shows how wide some of the, it paints the exact opposite picture here. When we get up high, it really shows how narrow that some of these corners are. It's Ty Dillon behind the wheel of the four here. He slides through Congress Plaza. Damn, he's driving the piss out of this. When you see just so much car movement, uh, you know, when you talk about how you set up for here, you can make the car kind of squishy and soft suspension. It's going to ride like a Cadillac. But, you know, when you think Cadillac, you don't think sports car. So you got to be careful because we can make them very comfortable as crew chiefs, but that doesn't mean that that's better. Sometimes, and, and DJ shaking his head because he understands when the crew chief says, I know you didn't like it, but it was faster. So that's yes. what we're going to race. Yes. And you just yeah. got to have to put up with it all day. Yeah. That, yeah. You can come in and you say, oh, man, that felt great. Well, yeah, that's great. You're down about 30th on the car. Right? <laughs> And we see Josh Williams uh, yeah. shaking it back and forth here. Josh, another one of the colleague drivers. So now remember, the top five advance, right? So with four minutes left, Larson probably feels great about his lap. But if you're Love or Mozak, you probably think, maybe I have to run again, go out and make another lap. See somebody like the five of Anthony Alfredo. He's out there four-tenths of a second slower than what Connor Mozak, who's currently fifth, has run. Gains quite a bit in turn four. Let's see if he can keep it going down Columbus. Right up against the wall as he came out of turn five. Lost a lot down Columbus, though, as he was four tenths of a second oh. back. Did he miss it? Yes, but made it. Does that make sense? <laughs> he missed where he wanted to be, but he, he survived the corner. Eight tenths of a second difference now for Alfredo Kim yeah and as we talk about Kyle Larson and his qualifying lap the interesting thing was he gave so much information on every single corner of that lap which corners he overdrove which corners he was tight specifically standing out to me is that he wheel hopped in six and then in eight he was not as fast as he wanted to be because he was so nervous on getting into the wall and then nine and ten a little bit loose so my question for Steve if you're getting all that information from a driver sure it's helpful but is there a point of diminishing return on how much information a driver is giving his team you know so Kim I listen to it all I write it all down and I say okay that's great let's just focus on one corner let's work on turn <laughs> four or the corner we have to your point Kim you try to kind of connect corners like maybe you start to see a handling characteristic in just the lefts or just the rights because you just don't have the experience level while there's no doubt what Larson's saying is exactly what he's feeling, I'm not sure I have enough experience to know what knobs to turn to fix all of those things. Yeah, and where can we make, where are the critical corners that we can make a difference and make speed that's going to translate into faster time? And the interesting thing, DJ, is that when I look at this street course, I think there's two things. There is qualifying speed, which is low lap time, and then there is race speed. So that whole slow section through congressional, you have to be great to qualify well, but no one's probably going to pass me there. Versus now when you ride on board with the 14 down the front straightaway, you have to get off 12 good because this left-hander turn one is a passing zone. So the 90-degree corners for me are the most important to be competitive in the race, but maybe not for qualifying, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense because places that you can where you're carrying speed through the center of a corner, attacking a corner, when you get into the race, you're not really going to be able to outbreak someone into many of these tight corners. So what you're going to focus on is the exit, and that's what we saw SVG be so good at last year, and we've seen it, that he is great hitting the apex and then launching from that point to where where he might not complete the pass before you're at the next corner, but he's got position on you to take that spot when you get to the next corner. We'll take another look at the five of Anthony Alfredo and the bumps you mentioned. Huh. Oh, yeah. you, you can't look at start that. to say he's not given everything he's got inside this car. Slid that thing right up against the wall, exiting turn 10. Connor Mozak is currently fourth fastest out on the track again. Steve, I think you mentioned it. You're too close to that line to be out there. We've got smoke oh, no. coming out. Can't tell if it's a tire rub or a mechanical. This is the four of Ty Dillon. I don't see any obvious damage, which tells me that this is more of a mechanical issue. I would assume an engine. Get it back to us. Did we run it too hot, you think? 
So did we run it too hot? You're allowed to add tape? I don't know. It looks just like rear end smoke. So there's some there's probably a gear line or something popped off from where we just changed that gear or something's leaking. So so two things. If that is gear oil, obviously something's leaking. Right. Because that's what smoke's coming. But if that's gear oil, you want to talk about making a racetrack slippery yeah. in a hurry. <laughs> Yeah, as if we need to add anything to this as Parker Retzloff finishes up his lap and that will end the qualifying for the first group group a again the top five Larson Kligerman Chandler Smith Connor Mozak and Jesse Love are the top five they will have another swing at potentially winning the pole here in Chicago And we are back at the Chicago Street Course. Round one of qualifying wrapped up, about to start round two, or group two. Austin Hill, unfortunately, won't make it to the second round. What more were you looking for? Yeah, our, our Dow Chevrolet has been decent in race trim, and I'm not gonna say that we have, have had a car that can win the race yet, but um, yeah, it seems like the track's a little different this year for us. Um, we did come a little bit different package-wise, and. You know, we ran really good here last year, so felt really good about it going in the, into the weekend. But right now we're struggling a little bit with a little bit of turn and then point. Um, and then when I do get it turned, I'm buzzing the rear tire. So we got a lot of things going on uh, with our Dow Chevrolet, but I know everybody at RCR and ECR is gonna get our Chevy tuned up for the race and we'll have to come up through the field, but it'll be a show to, that we can put on. Again, Austin Hill, part of Group 1 as engines fire and cars are out on track for Group 2, round 1 of qualifying. They're going to try to space themselves out again here as the second group makes its way onto the course. I think this is, you have the opportunity here. You, 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 I think you basically want to give yourself some room, but there are some guys that like to have kind of a rabbit out in front of them to, to chase, to kind of uh, get a visual off of as to how they go about attacking this. You see the 19 of Ty Gibbs right behind him, the 20 of John Hunter, we had mentioned it earlier in practice. They showed up, went through inspection, and they had some sort of information, not sure exactly what that is, that caused them to change an engine before they ever hit the racetrack. So he's gonna start at the back of the field regardless. So. Qualifying does kind of matter because it's pit pick next week, but it's just you know, how much risk you want to take. This is going to be a great onboard, though, because Ty Gibbs, I have him as one of the favorites to advance. That was the alternate start finish line, so he's now on the clock heading into turn 12. Back on Columbus Drive here, and he'll be heading down into turn number one. It's always daunting as a driver. One of the fastest parts, I mean, you're well up at 150 miles an hour, and the thing that you see that you're looking straight at is a wall right in front of you. You know, that, okay, I have to get this woe down, but I also have to carry speed through here. Fourth gear right there, so he's in high gear. 141, we saw the speed before he started to slow down. There was no part of that that looked fun. That was, I mean, hair raising. And look, at now we see left-hand side. We're gonna see the footwork. Those taps on the throttle is to allow the car to downshift a little smoother. Ooh, into the chip there, decided not to shift. That would be more just trying to get your fast lap, uh, obviously, in a situation during the, the race. Probably not going to be up on that, or you would roll out of the throttle just a little bit not to get on that chip for very long. Final turn before he crosses that alternate start finish line right there. And Gibbs goes 30-64. Sam Mayer a little faster at a 29-88. Yeah, that 64 would be good enough in the top five, but Gibbs is continuing. I'm not sure if he loved that lap. He's going to go ahead and run another one. Thank Toyota for that onboard camera. Great look at the feet. We have SVG right there. Yeah, when you look at the lineup in this group, I think that you're going to have to run faster than what they did in that first. I agree. I think there's more yeah. pace in this group overall. So now, I mean, you can't think Chicago without this guy. Jumped on the scene, won the cup race. WeatherTech helping us out with this view. 
as he makes his way into turn four. That was where he made the pass a year ago in the cup race for the win. You see first Sam Mayer, he's in the red on the bottom right, about a tenth off. But I believe where he's gonna make all his time is from six around. The, the kind of the sweeping section, I think that suits, you know, V8 supercar street racing experience. Yeah, he's so precise in hitting these apexes and getting the most, carrying that speed. Look how far he's turning that. So here's two tenths up, missed that corner a little bit. Yeah. So now we're comparing to fifth, so he's gonna easily jump up into fifth. It's gonna be a big gain there. Gibbs actually oh. improved his lap, and oh, oh will hop there. Yep. He totally missed that corner. Yep. Oh, still fastest at a stick. <laughs> seven, seven. So good. That's not, I would probably leave that out when I talk to the other, you know, if I was one of these other guys, I would say he missed 12 and is the fastest guy here. Oh, no, six is off course. Yep. Thomas Nunziata out of New Jersey is into the tire barrier. He went through the turn. That's one of the runoff areas. Down there in turn four. That was where we saw earlier 141 miles an hour trying to slow it down to make that right-hander. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he had kind of hit the tire barrier there because I was wondering exactly how he parked that thing in there right. at the angle that he was. Crank it left, you gotta clear the wall. Now his spotter's telling him how to get out. <laughs> if he can. Keep coming. Crank it left, back out. Since he's in the runoff area, the course is still green, so qualifying continuing for everyone else. But the issue will be when he backs out here, this will be, he's coming back into traffic. Kim. And Kyle Larson, fastest in Group A of qualifying. As you look at your first round, what do you feel like you can change or do differently in your second in terms of how you attack the racetrack? Um, I think just the faster sections, I just need to go faster and, and push a little bit harder. Um, like breaking into four, I'm a little bit early, and then I'm a little bit over slowed through the middle of that section. And then uh, like nine all the way to 11, um, I just give up time there. I mean, I give up time other places as well, but the fast stuff, I'm just like really cautious right now because I have to qualify in. So I'm um, just trying to get a lap in. But, um, having fun so far and kind of learning each lap. I haven't really gotten many, none of us have gotten many laps yet with all the you know, cautions and stuff throughout practice. So just trying to creep up on it without getting too greedy. That tells you just how challenging this place is because there's not an oval that Kyle Larson would be concerned about qualifying in, but he just knows one mistake, yeah. wrecks this race car, and now here you are with one of the favorites not in the race. You mentioned one of the favorites, and I think every time we would go to a road course, or even when we come to the street course, you would say A.J. Allmendinger has to be one of the favorites. But it's surprising how SVG has almost overshadowed what A.J. Allmendinger has been able to do. A.J. Allmendinger is the winningest road course racer in NASCAR. I mean, he has won Cup Series, he's won Xfinity Series on road courses all over. But SVG, running for the same team, now has put up numbers and continues to do things behind the wheel that were almost going, wow, AJ now is taking a back seat to SVG. Well, and then you see him end up six right here. It just shocks me. I think he in my, he was an automatic lock for the right. top five in sure. my mind when I think of yeah. the guys won. You said it, Ring. 11 road course wins in the Xfinity Series level. And shaking his head. I don't, I don't know what to do with our cars anymore on the road courses. I mean, I'm like, just... So, that, so that's an interesting thing, right? So he's frustrated because he's some sort of feel he's not getting. And you mentioned SVG. And it's easy to say, well, you're driving when he's driving and SVG's fast, but we don't know their style. Right. We don't know if something's... You know, when I crew chief Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson was our teammate. Well, I can assure you, as Jimmy beat us, we were like, well, let's try that. And it just didn't work for us. And that almost makes it more frustrating when you know what the fastest person has. It's almost not knowing is better than knowing. And you can almost hear the frustration because with his resume, he should be, and I agree with him, up there for second, third type speed. Saw the resume there of A.J. Allmendinger. 
More issues for the 53 of Kenko Muda. That's turn two. Backed it in to the tire barriers there. And that one. Yeah, he's gotten away with the other spins. Yes. But. Daniel Suarez, one of the nine drivers that are doing double duty. He'll run in both the Xfinity Series race and the Cup Series race tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, he had a spin in practice also, getting down into turn two. I love what Suarez is doing here, driving this DGM racing Chevy. You know, we see this a lot with Ross Chastain. He gets into a car in the Xfinity Series. We don't think of winning type quite equipment, but Daniel, this is about him. Says, hey, I want to do everything I can do to be as prepared for Sunday as possible. And if you're DGM, you're thinking, man, we get Daniel Suarez. This is a cup winner at a road course. He won Sonoma a year ago, so he's already won this year. He's in the playoffs. It's kind of a really a win-win, right? He gets laps, and the team can get some honest feedback on kind of where they're at, what they should expect out of their equipment. And we talk about the Charlotte area NASCAR fans a couple weeks ago. He came up, Dan did and did a Daniel's Amigos event up here. And all the B-roll I asked him about, he goes, man, you know, fans come out. They didn't have the best weather, and they still had a great turnout. And he's doing a great job of, you know, spreading the word of just how great NASCAR racing can be. Turn four, Rick. You looked at that as amazement. <laughs> you want to ride? We can get a two-seater. You want to go for a ride? I'm not driving. Not a Maybe chance. DJ will take you. Look at how much he's working behind the wheel of his car. That is, it's... It's a rough area through four and five, but man, he's working hard. Over the bridge and back down onto Michigan Avenue here, turn seven. That's the corner we saw last year, Chase Elliott wrecked because you just have to get so close to that right. Right, DJ, you kind of yep. touch it with your right side and then you have no exit. Yes. And that's what's so unique about a street course, walls. I mean, you've got to try to get your car right up next to the wall, which these drivers aren't used to. There's not walls on road courses. There's runoff areas that you talk about and lines that you want to hit. Sometimes you'll hit the rumble strips. You can't hit the wall here and not be damaged by it. Kim. And catch it up with Parker Kligerman. Before we got on air, he said, I just want to go fast. Good news is you are fast. You'll make it into round two. Bad news is you're going to change an engine and have to start from the rear of the field later this afternoon. What does that mean for you and this race team in terms of what you can do in the next round of qualifying? Although it doesn't matter for today and then in the race. Yeah, I mean, we're really, you know, qualifying for pit selection next week. Um, but I'm proud of everyone on this spike core, Chevy. Uh, you know, this car is awesome. Patrick Donnie and everyone did a great job. It's really dialed in. We made some changes from here last year that have obviously been the right things. I had a lap that I think I could have got Larson, uh, but I messed up the final corner a little bit. So we got a little more speed in the tank, which is great. And you know, I, the engine thing is a shame. They discovered that before practice, but you know, we rarely ever have issues. ECR gives us some incredible power. So, you know, we'll, this is gonna be a tough place to pass, starting in the back. Um, but maybe we can pull some strategy and you know what what fun would life be if it wasn't difficult sometimes You know, I think we've got a car that's fast it's been the internet which is in our favor and that Kim most of all I'm having a blast here in downtown Chicago driving race cars in the streets of this city It's a wonderful day. There's gonna be a huge crowd this weekend. It is so cool to be here yeah, we'll see Parker on track this afternoon. And then tomorrow he's going to be showcasing all of the cool things around the race course for us during the Cup Series race. And he's also going to be, he's a big music lover. So he's going to be taking in the concerts as well that are happening in the park. Oh, close call there for Riley Herbst. You know, it's interesting. I know they have to change engines, but as I look at my watch, there was a time where that was about an hour because we did it every week. But this, that's not something you do every week anymore. You're not really set up in the garage. The haulers are in a different location. So obviously they know how much time they need. But and you hate to do a big mechanical change like that in a hurry. I'm still going back to the part that he could only come up with one corner that he missed. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that it would have been at least six out of the 12 for me. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't want to tell him, and he said he could have got Larson. I was like, well, SVG, he missed turn 12 also. <laughs> yeah. Cole Custer, though, here is trying to improve. He's already fifth, trying to make sure there's room. If other guys go faster, he kind of had it but gave it back. It'll all come down to the last corner. Final 80 seconds of qualifying for this second group. Oh, wow. Picked up. 
Uh, I thought he picked up. He ended up being about the same. AJ Almendinger is trying it again. So he's on the clock and headed down the front stretch. This would be the shock of the day for me, and we've had quite a few shocks if AJ Almendinger doesn't advance into the final round and get a shot to sit on the pole here or at least battle for it. Yeah, and, and I know that he has the whole race and his skills will get him up front, but you would like for AJ to go into the race with a good mindset. And if he can't make it into this next round of qualifying, that's not a good starting point for this driver. Yeah, mentally demoralizing. Uh, as good as he is behind the wheel on road courses and the street course, coming into turn four here, he's still in the red compared to Cole Custer, who's fifth. It's just incredible how much movement of the wheel and how hard, as you pointed out, Rick, that they're having to work through that part of the track. And I said it about his teammate. I'll say the same thing when I think of Almendinger. I think this next section, just very technical. You know, he's a road course guy, right? He did it in open wheels, done it in stock car. It seems like that it, listening to his comment a while ago that what they used to have was very predictable in their, their race cars and something that they have done to try to improve uh, maybe isn't giving AJ the feel and the confidence to go do what he does best and that's attack. Wow, got loose there in turn nine and it's close, but I, he didn't get into the top five there on that lap. He didn't. I mean, that is not going to help the mindset for AJ. And the clock has gone away at the top. Anybody that's on a lap they can still complete it. Yeah. I was a little surprised Gibbs because he's going to advance. It's another lap on his tires. But there is also some, you know, rhythm to this. Hey, go run a lap. We'll see if they haven't finished this one or if he just gets off the gas. No, it looks like he's continuing. Nope. There you go. Now they said that's enough. Don't risk it through this tight section. Familiarity with the course. These drivers had the opportunity yesterday and then again this morning to walk the course just to see every inch of it. And as you mentioned, the surprise, I think, of this qualifying session, A.J. Allmendinger is sixth, though he will not advance to the second round of qualifying. We see Van Ginsbergen, Mayer, Gibbs, Custer, and Nemechek all coming out of this group that will advance. A party in the park continues. Next up on USA, it's Victory Lane Review from a week ago in Nashville. Then it's Cup's turn to take on the streets here for practice and qualifying. That's at 12.30, 2 o'clock pro motocross from Redbud. And at 3 o'clock, countdown to green in the Xfinity Series racing at 3.30 on NBC and streaming on Peacock. Moving on to that final round, the top five of each group, Larson heading Group A and Shane Van Gisbergen heading Group B. But noticeably missing from this list, A.J. Allmendinger. We'll see Parker Kligerman, pretty good lap there in Group A. The poll will be determined when we return to Chicago. festival atmosphere here for this race but there's been so many things that have happened in Grant Park I saw the Pope the greatest basketball player of all time from right here in Chicago and MJ now team owner with 2311 the Cubs and their celebration and of course a year ago the first ever street course for NASCAR and it was Shane Van Gisbergen who got the win in that cup race, you take a look at some statistics. 313-acre public park, and this place will be packed. There are concerts going on. People will be everywhere uh, right here in Chicago's front yard, just taking in the sights, which a lot of people, and the statistics came in from a, a year ago, a lot of people from the, the city area were the visitors that came to watch racing, and most of them hadn't seen a NASCAR race before. And so they were immersed in this sport, and it's evident
that they've come back because we've been walking the streets for you know a couple days now and the wide-eyed fans that are walking along here and and just so inquisitive about you know oh how fast do the cars go and what's the horsepower and and all the the different questions you get they're so interested in what's taking place here and they love their sports and if you want to question it walk around with seven footer brad doherty <laughs> right. they're very crystal clear that he played for the calves yes. and not the bulls yes. so we get some good heckling out there i love it and the other thing that just in one year seeing the need for more amenities here for the fans i mean we know you know how much they missed out on because of the weather last year with the concerts and things all of that happening but you know they built um, new opportunities as to where you can now watch the race from uh, because there was a need for that that's navy pier in the background back there uh, voted one of the greatest places to watch fireworks oh. in america wednesday night was spectacular <laughs> i was here and it was just it was fascinating up on a rooftop bar it was amazing to watch so you mentioned viewing opportunity i did a little looking into the tickets and how it works. And there's really a lot of GA opportunities. So for general admission, you get on the grounds, but there's a few grandstands that aren't reserved seating. Your general admission tickets get you into those grandstands. Then if you want to have a reserved seat, you have that option. We talked about the hospitality and that general admission kind of gets you into the concert. So there is, you know, if you want to feel it out for the first time, you don't have to commit to something special. Just come walk around and enjoy it. It's always a good sight when we see the Hendrick entry of HendrickCars.com, number 17. Larson's behind the wheel this week. So now his his lap time has been posted. So remember he mentioned, hey, I got to race my way into the field. I got to qualify. So now he's in because he's already, he would fall back on his first round time. So the question will be, what level of aggression do you take? Everybody, your ego wants to be the fastest car here, but a misstep could really hurt, right? I mean, first is better than 10th, but you're already at the front 25% of the field. And Steve, this is a short race, relatively short yeah, race as far as stops, because qualifying very important where you start here. Yeah, in theory, you could basically do this on, on one pit stop. You got to put fuel in at one point around halfway. You could probably come a little bit earlier in the stages. So, you know, your opportunity to recover is a little more difficult than, say, a four or five hundred mile race at an oval that you would have multiple pit stops. Yeah. And if you're like Kyle Larson, or even Sam Mayer, you want to be up where SBG, he's obviously the favorite. You don't want to be having to work your way through traffic and never seeing exactly what you might need to change or how much faster do you need to get or being close enough to him to see where you might be getting beat and you can pick up there. You know, we were just talking about the interesting thing with cars that are so fast like Sam Mayer right here, they almost look like it's easier. Right, they are less out of control. Like right there, there was a foot to the barrier. When we ride on board, some of them, their hands are a little quieter. It's just, you know, they're not having to I don't want to say try so hard. They don't have to be so close to out of control to still run a good lap time. This will determine the top 10 starting positions and the pull as we see a little lock up here out of Mayer. Yeah, Mayer's trying to make me look foolish. She goes, oh, you think it looks easy? I'm going to lock my right front tire and show you what you know. And that's the bumpy area of the track that uh, he had that lock up in. To Congress Plaza, that sweeping left-hander. Turn nine, we'll call it. There's 10. And the final turn for this qualifying session is 11. Right there is the start finish line. Alternate start finish line. And a 30 19. A little slower, but I think that's to be in probably anticipate with the laps on the tires. So yeah, I mean, I really think that this tire they brought here um, should have a little bit of tire fall off or, you know, reduced grip second time around. Now, Larson's going to say, I don't think so. Yeah. And he's going to run well in the 29s if he can just get through this final corner. So talented at every discipline of racing. And Larson goes at 29, 46. Wow. We thought that might be what SVG would run. I don't know if we saw Larson doing it. I got to be faster in the fast sections. That was yeah. the Larson quote. What I'm guessing he was faster in the fast <laughs> sections. And we talked about Sam Mayer's uh, lap. That, you know, we saw that block up for him. That could have been you know, two or three tenths in itself. And here's SVG, final corner. This is where he had an issue last time in his lap. And Clean there. Is going to best Larson by two one hundredths. 2.2 miles, 12 corners, bumps, and tire barriers, and chaos. Two one-hundredths of a second different. 
So I guess they're going to get to see each other quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Chandler Smith. And that's oh, how close yeah. you get in turn four. Here's Parker. And Parker Klingerman also tagging, tagging the wall there out of 11, trying to get as much as he can at the alternate start finish line. You know, I think SVG is on a, another, he's a still on the racetrack. I don't know if he is either A, running another lap at speed or just cooling the brakes off. But. Yeah, like he slowed down, I think, but I could be wrong about that. You know, the bottom of the screen, it's definitely off the yep. pace. And you hear him shutting the engine off. So what you could do is you shut it off, run air through the radiator for the little bit of opening you have. It cools the air that's sitting in the radiator. Then start it up, cycle the water, and, and it can cool the engine quicker. He's probably doing that because they figure with four minutes left, he could do that for a lap, come down pit road, and maybe get one more lap in if need be. Here's Jesse Love. Finishing his lap 130.6. He will take the hard right to pit road. John Hunter. I think he hasn't started his lap yet. Nope, you can see he's nice and calm, not heating those tires up too much. This car, as we mentioned earlier, is going to have to change engines and go to the back as well. So SVG on the bottom right you see is on another fast lap. So he just rode around for a lap cooling his car and now he's gonna go again. You see John Hunter now at speed. So he just started his lap. Clock starts for the 20. John Hunter even check as there's still three minutes and 45 seconds to go in this qualifying session. And again, they have to get to the line to start their lap before that clock expires. So Steve, do you think it's surprising that they wouldn't have taped a little bit more for maybe just the one lap effort? Yeah, you know, all downforce helps. I guess this track's so technical, maybe they just want to give their driver the opportunity to get a couple shots at it versus the extra downforce. We had mentioned earlier A.J. Allmendinger and Shane Van Gisbergen driving for the same team but different styles. I think that was one of the eye-opening things that all of the drivers saw is Shane Van Gisbergen does something different with his feet than yeah. everybody else. Yes. He actually uses a clutch. Yes, and, and I, I I was kind of laughing to myself. That's the way I was taught to do it and always did it through my career. Not that I was anywhere close to the talent of these guys, but that's how I learned. But trying to make a switch from something you have been doing and this is a lot more difficult. I mean, positioning the pedals and knowing exactly how far back you want it to the amount of pressure that you're gonna apply on the brake and be able to match that up to where you can reach the gas pedal. It is way more difficult than just saying, okay, you need to change the way that you're doing this. All right. Here's Cole Custer and Whoa. he was way out of shape in turn four. And I'm pretty fortunate that this wasn't worse. Trying to get everything out of the lap. And you see he's 1.5 seconds off of what Van Ginsbergen did. Well, we talk a lot about, you know, SVG and Larson, Sam Mayer, because their laps are so impressive. But as we see Custer finish his, we have Connor Bozak in that 88, who's only a tenth of a second off. The 25-year-old from Charlotte, right? He's the he's driven late models for Junior Motorsports. He has a, you know. A little over 20 Xfinity Series starts. He's won in Trans Am, so, you know, he's known in the road course world. That's kind of where his yeah. base has come from, and you're seeing why, as he's only maybe a little over a tenth off. We don't have to look that far back to what Junior Motorsports has done as far as advancing their drivers uh, up through the ranks. You look at Josh Berry, who came out of Junior Motorsports, was a late model driver that uh, Dale Jr. raced against and saw the talent, and he raced for Junior Motorsport. Oh, handful there for Connor Mozak through nine. But Josh Berry, you know, now is a cup driver, and could that be the next step for Connor Mozak uh, to make that transition? Wow, third, that's a great effort. Gibbs says he's not done. He's going to try to improve 
jump up there to the top. This is actually his first lap. I'm sorry, I thought he had already made one run. So he waited right to the end with only 40 something seconds left. He's fully committed. He probably could run another lap if needed and he has enough temperature in the engine. He was in the green until he got through six. And you just see how much time he's lost in this slower section. Yeah, slow from the standpoint, it is slower yeah. than a lot of us. Slower than <laughs> that, the other about, sections. How yeah. hard you have to attack that. And, and it just goes to show you, you know, what SBG and, and Kyle Larson were doing through there. So all 10 in that second group have completed their laps. 90.12 for Ty Gibbs, and he's also got the opportunity. He's still digging. We'll see if he advances from this one, but he was fourth on his first lap. Well, I was going to say, I, 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 I like the congratulations, but it's like, don't really call a right. run in the hole. I've seen a few go, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and Ty was pretty good until that slow section. And we don't know, maybe he made a mistake and just tried to put a good lap in. We'll see if he can improve in that area. I mean, two tenths of a second is a reasonable pickup around here. Well, it is, but on his previous lap, he was a tenth to a tenth and a half better than those guys. Uh, so um, I don't see where he's going to pick up that much uh, at the places that gave him problems. Yeah, right there he was in the green on his last lap. Now still in the red here by a tenth. But there's a possibility. Let's see if he can do it. It's almost like hitting the chip there doesn't allow him to drive into that corner as hard as others because, you know, he gave up probably two tenths in that one spot and then he just continues to lose speed through this section. Shifted at a different point also through turn nine and he's going to be about a half a second off of what Ben Gisbergen had posted. But fourth fastest for Ty Gibbs. It is official now. Shane Van Gisbergen has won his second career pole in just his 18th start, Kim. Rick, he made it look easy out there winning the pole. You say, oh, no. Okay, so looking at the race today, what or who is going to be the biggest challenge for you in this team? Yeah, it looks like Kyle's very quick as well, and, and Ty was fast there till, till the end. But, yeah, what an awesome start. The Call of Racing guys are giving us some rockets, and where the Tech Chevy is pretty quick. I've kept it straight so far, so i got to do that in the race. But... These street circuits are tough, and every lap the track's evolving, getting better and better, and more and more rubber down in different spots. Um, and then we're going to have the cup practice now, and then the race will be different again. So, But, yeah, looking forward to it. There's some fast guys, and hopefully we can have a clean race out front. I know the track's evolving. The cup cars will go on the track. How different will the track be when you guys race here this afternoon? Uh, ask me in about an hour when I go out there. But, yeah, I think it will be. It'll still be pretty hot by the time we race and be pretty slick. But... It's the same for everyone, so hopefully it's a fun race. Congrats. Thank you. SVG taking the pole here this afternoon. Busy day for him, you guys. He's going to hop in the cup car before he takes on the Xfinity race here this afternoon. Have you ever seen him without a smile on his face? No, that's so I great. mean, he is living life to its fullest right now. As we see, he'll start in the front row alongside Kyle Larson, the two fastest in qualifying there. Connor Mozak uh, in that second row with Ty Gibbs. John Hunter Nemechek won't be able to start there. Qualified row three. He has to go to the back. Parker Kligerman, same situation, both due to engine issues. Jesse Love, another impressive run. See, Cole, Cole Custer. Custer. Yeah, last, last year's, year's winner. winner. We're good, good at this. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to you all the time, Rick. I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, I think, A.J. Allmendinger there in row six. And Joey Logano, we haven't said a whole lot about him. He's taking that ride over. Haley Deegan was in it full time. Joey's going to drive it this weekend, row eight. Preston Partis, always good at the road courses there in row nine. Anthony Alfredo, that's a good lap. Yeah. Look back there, Riley Herbst, way back more than I anticipated. Good road race uh, most of the time. Going to have to uh, make some magic. And a little further in the field, see Brandon Jones uh, there in row 16 alongside Daniel Suarez. And some names that are going to be joined by some other big names. Justin Allgaier, Sheldon Creed at the back. It's good, you know. We think it's narrow and qualifying. Let's check out some traffic in the race. Let's hear from the other driver that's going to start up front. Standing by with Kim is Kyle. Yeah, Kyle Larson with a great qualifying effort there. And talking with SVG, he said you're going to be one of his biggest threats this afternoon. Do you feel like you have everything it takes to win here this afternoon? I don't know. <laughs> He's so good. So uh, I think when you have full grip, sure, I can run a similar lap time. Good job. 
But uh, I think when you get the pace starts falling off and all that, he's just really good at adjusting his style and, and, and also racing. His race craft's way better than ours. But uh, I think our opportunity is there's an opportunity there to, to beat him. But, um, yeah, it's just going to – it'll get crazy. Like, we're all, I'm sure, going to end up in traffic at some point. So picking your way through that's going to be important. But, um, yeah, I mean, pretty – I would have liked to have been a little bit better. I, I definitely left quite a bit out there. I missed a few corners pretty bad, but so did he. So, um, but no, he's just, uh, he's really good. He's just really good through like the fast stuff. He's just a lot more brave and comfortable with the proximity of his race car to the wall than I currently am. So, um, and I'm okay with that right now. So I uh, just got to get a little bit, a little bit better. And um, I think, you know, maybe we can find even more speed and then, yeah, see if we can try and beat him. Guys, opportunity is the word that jumps out to me from Kyle Larson. We'll see if he can pounce on it this afternoon. I love hearing Kyle Larson, who a lot considered one of the greatest race car drivers in the world today, show that amount of respect yeah, for yes. Shane Van Gisbergen. Yeah, fantastic. I think his biggest thing, can he pressure SVG enough to maybe make a mistake? Coming up next, it's Victory Lane Review, then cup practice and qualifying from here in the streets of Chicago. Pro Motocross from Red Bud at 2 o'clock on NBC, then... We'll get underway with the Xfinity Series race at 3 o'clock with countdown to green and 3.30 with the green flag. So much different from a year ago where rain shortened the Xfinity Series race almost in half. And today the weather looks beautiful here in Chicago. And the horsepower of NASCAR is back on the streets to take on... Lakeshore, Columbus, and Michigan. Who will win today? Stay with us.